Now, many years ago, uh, the evangelist Don Double, who uh, I knew very well, and was the, I call him the midwife of the church here, uh, because it was through his ministry that this came into being. But he coined a phrase which really struck with me, and he says, when God and man make contact, miracles happen. And scripture is full of those sort of things happening. I'm going to look at uh, three of them at least today. Uh, If you want a title, it's the touch of God. When God and man make contact, miracles happen. Now there are three things about the touch of God on a person's life that we need to remember. And the first one is once God touches uh, and possesses someone, it isn't a part-time possession. It's for a lifetime The Lord will never surrender to Satan what is his. And secondly, those whom God possesses, he preserves. Another P. We may falter, fail, or fall into devastating sin, but once God possesses us, he will never give up on us. Psalm 37, verse 28 says, For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. And thirdly, the third P, those whom God possesses, he prepares for ever increasing usefulness. This includes even the fallen, discouraged servants. Now you may be convinced that God has given up on you, that he can't use you anymore. But the truth is, if you have a contrite heart, you're being prepared for something greater. God uses even those things that Satan intends to destroy us. We find this pattern at work in the lives of God-possessed people throughout the Bible. We read of godly saints falling into deplorable failure and sin. At times they're ready to quit, but God doesn't, doesn't give up on them. Instead, he keeps coming to them. And out of the ashes of ruin, many are restored. Indeed, their best days are still ahead of them. Just think back, if you can, to the time when God came to you, supernaturally touching your soul. He called you to himself and filled you with his spirit. And at that very moment, God made a commitment to you. And he says, I want you, and I claim you. You are now my possession. And I trust if you haven't done that yet, It's a good time on Palm Sunday to give your heart and life to the Lord Jesus. Suddenly, he took control of your life and nothing was going to change that fact. You became God's purchased possession. Acts 20 verse 28 tells us the church of God which he bought, purchased with his own blood. The creator of the universe universe bought you with the price of his own shed blood and nothing has power over that blood. So you remain God's possession even when the powers of hell seduce and condemn you. Satan himself may ensnare you in a hellish trap. Yet just as he thinks, I've got him, God answers, no you devil, you can't have him, he's mine. I have purchased him. Now release my property. You're still God's possession and he's preserving you, preparing you for his best. So let's first of all consider the God-possessed leader of Israel, Moses. Moses was possessed by God. The Lord preserved him through a trial after trial. And all along God was preparing this man for a greater work. Moses was touched by God while he lived in Pharaoh's house. And as a result, Moses refused to be called Pharaoh's son. If we've been looking through Hebrews, this came out. Hebrews 11, 25 to 26. He chose to be ministered along with the people of God, mistreated, sorry, along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than all the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. There was no doubting then that God touched Uh, God's touch on Moses' life while he was in Egypt. Moses rejected all that was of the flesh. And he knew he was called to be deliverer of Israel. In fact, he assumed the Israelites would recognize him as their deliverer when he killed the Egyptian slave driver. You can read it in Acts 7, 24 and 25. They didn't. So he had to, instead, Moses had to fear Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh. 
because of his action. So we're told he fled Egypt. Yet by the time he left, Moses was totally God-possessed. He'd given up all for the sake of Christ. Little did he know, however, he was about to enter a long wilderness period. He was hidden on the backside of a desert for 40 years. What does the wilderness period in Moses' life represent? Well, it's a time that many God-possessed servants face. Sometimes they feel stuck in a place far beneath their abilities. Their role is desperately short of what they believe God has in mind for them. Moses was such a servant. He had a mighty call of God on his life, and he dreamed of doing great works for God. Yet he was stuck on the backside of a desert with no apparent future. I wonder how often Moses looked back at the flock of sheep and prayed, God, you touched me so clearly. I thought you called me to be your deliverer. You have left me. Why have you left me out here with these sheep? Surely you could have entrusted me with more than tending a few sheep. You gave me an education from Egypt's highest learning centers. You showed me mighty things that could be done through your hand. But I feel overlooked, put on a shelf. Is this all there is for me? No doubt Moses felt as if time had run out for him. He had no voice, no message. So he resigned himself to being a backside of the wilderness shepherd. But God was committed to this man. And all the while Moses frustra was frustrated with his limited existence, God was preserving and preparing him for greater things. During this time, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, was scouting the wilderness, locating water, navigating trail trails, finding routes. Moses didn't realize that Jethro was about to become Israel's guide through the desert. God's hidden shepherds were being prepared all along, trained in wilderness survival for the work ahead. Then suddenly Moses had his encounter with the burning bush. The bush was probably a common shrub, low to the ground and useless. But God set that bush on fire and a voice came out of it saying, Take off your shoes, Moses. You're standing on holy ground. God spoke a message directly to Moses' heart. When God and man make contact, miracles happen. And after just a few hours of that burning bush, Moses' life was never the same. God instructed him, go and gather the children of Israel and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Here was a God-possessed man who'd been preserved and prepared for many years. Now he was being addressed by God himself from a burning bush. It was all meant to tell Moses, Moses, I haven't forgotten you. I've been with you all along. I was the one who led you into the wilderness and I have protected you from Pharaoh. Now you're about to enter or do greater things in your service for me. That burning bush was the fire of the Holy Spirit moving through a natural object. God took a useless shrub and caused incredible changes to take place through it. Perhaps you feel you're on the backside of a wilderness right now. You wonder, why am I not being used? You've given me a heart to do more for your kingdom. Don't pass me by. Or let me encourage you. God is committed to you, to you just as he was to Moses. You may be frustrated with your uh, limited existence, but all the while God is preserving and preparing you. You may not be called to do some great work, but you're being called to a new walk with the Lord, such as you have never experienced before. And you're being called to minister Christ as never before. Your role is simply to believe God will take you to higher ground. He wants to reveal more of himself to you, to put his fire in you, he wants those around you to realize that you have been with Jesus. Let's take another one. David was also a God-possessed man. David had a fierce battle with lust in his heart. Here was a giant killer soldier, an anointed psalm writer, a king mightily used to rule God's chosen people. The Lord himself called David a man after his own heart. Yet at the very heart of God's blessing and favor, 
Davy was surprised by a violent attack of lust. This righteous king had just won a string of victories over enemy after enemy. He had re, uh, recaptured and restored the ark, and he had received from the Lord a promise of an everlasting house. So, uh, 2 Samuel 8, 14 says, The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. Then one day, David saw Bathsheba and was overcome by horrendous lust. We know the story. He committed adultery, conceiving a child with her. David tried desperately to hide this terrible sin. He manipulated, schemed, and lied to cover it up. Finally, he fell so low that he caused the murder of his lover's husband. David's awful sin would make headlines in any society, in any age. And if you lived during his time, you probably think God is about to give, him, give up on that man. He has sinned against such great light. Yet what does David's low point represent to us today? Well, I believe it's a picture of the God-possessed servant who has been surprised by an overwhelming love. Satan tries to surprise every servant who's serious about their walk with God. The enemy would like nothing more than to destroy the faith of every God-possessed believer. However, it doesn't matter what your sin may be. There's no such sin in your life that would cause God to give up on you. You are still his purchased possession. Even though David despised God by committing adultery, the Lord didn't quit on him. The Bible tells us in 2 Samuel 12, verse 1, the Lord sent Nathan to David. While Moses was challenged by a burning bush, David was confronted by a prophet. And Nathan pointed out to him and said, You're the man who has sinned. You have committed adultery. How did David respond? Well, he humbled himself, confessing, I have sins against the Lord. David suffered dire consequences for his sin. But God preserved him through the ordeal. And after Nathan confronted David, he told the king, The Lord has taken away your sin. In fact, David was being prepared for even greater ministry after his fall. His voice was heard throughout the land as never before. Today we read his anointed words in the Psalms. Indeed, the word of God revealed to David through his trial is still being preached today. Sadly, Saul's David predecessor wasn't <coughs> preserved as David was. Saul was also touched by God and possessed by his spirit. But Saul disobeyed every uh, word the prophet Samuel spoke to him. Instead of humbling himself, Saul grew bitter and angry towards God. The Lord tried to reach Saul again at Ramah, pouring out his spirit on him. But Saul just shut him out. He gave up on God completely, turning to a witch for counsel. In fact, God will <clears throat> never quit on you if you're entangled in sin. <clears throat> He'll bring you, excuse me, <clears throat> saved by the bell. <clears throat> in fact, his God will never give up, quit on you. If you're entangled in sin, he'll bring you face to face with a convicting prophetic word. The truth is, if you will confess and forsake your sin, if you'll trust God to keep his covenant promise to you, you'll not only be forgiven and restored, but your best, most fruitful days will be ahead of you. All it needs is a contrite heart. And thirdly, Peter, hence the reading we had, was truly a God-possessed man. This God-possessed disciple committed the worst of all sin. It was one thing for Moses to flee and hide from God. It was another for David to despise the Lord. But worst of all, Peter denied knowing Christ, even cursing his Lord. Jesus had said his good friend was a rock. The bold disciple had even walked on water with the Lord, and he boldly declared the word uh, would, uh, that he would die for his master. Yet later, when Peter was accused of being Christ's disciples, he answered with these chilling words in Matthew 26, 77, 72, sorry, I do not know the man. And when the cry persisted, in verse 74, Peter began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Can you imagine this awful scene? Had we known Peter, we would have thought, that's it, Peter's finished. He cursed the very face of God. 
and he denied Jesus, help sending him to the cross. There's no hope for him. God has to give up on him. The devil must have gloated over Peter's fall, crying, I've got him. You're all mine now. But God wouldn't give up his ownership. He was going to preserve Peter. And he cried, no devil, he's my property. Just watch what I'll do with him. And while Moses was apprehended by a burning bush and David by a prophet, Peter was apprehended by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brought to Peter's remembrance the words of Jesus, which said unto him, in verse 75, Before the rooster crows, you would disown me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. He showed a contrite heart. The Holy Spirit fell on Peter, convicting and melting him. The disciple was given a broken heart and a contrite spirit. I've jumped ahead of myself. I knew it was in my brain somewhere. And just a few weeks later, we see a wholly different Peter. This man preached the gospel boldly at Pentecost to at least 3,000 people. The disciple who shriveled in cowardice before a servant girl was now a fearless evangelist, full of fire and anointing. Here's a prime example of how the Lord preserves and prepares his possessions. Do you see the pattern? Peter was being prepared even in his denial of Jesus. What the devil intended as gross evil, God turned to his own glory. The same priest who witnessed Peter <clears throat> deny Jesus later saw him stand and preach the resurrected Christ. Peter's holy boldness caused them to marvel. And we read in Acts 4.13, they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And fourthly then, God has made an oath to preserve and make fruitful everyone he possesses. The Lord has sworn by covenant to rescue and restore fallen, wounded servants that he possesses. I wonder, can you honestly say to God that, that, that he has made you his possession this morning? I hope so. I can remember the day it happened to me. I was just six years old. And I got down by my bed. And I asked Jesus to come into my heart and control my life. And I know exactly who the preacher was. It was a Mr. Moody, not the, the D.H. Moody, of course, I'm that old. But he was a Moody, an evangelist from Bristol. And he preached on Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I'll come in and I'll have fellowship with him. And that's what he did. And I thought, when I, even at six, I didn't know a lot, brought up in a Christian home, but I still had to make a decision. And I said, Lord, don't stand outside the door. Come in. And because the Lord possessed me then, he has preserved me throughout the years. And he has delivered me from the, uh, the devil's schemes time and time again. He has stepped in each time saying, I won't let you have him, devil. Now in my 79th year, I believe the best is still yet to come. Even it might be in glory, who knows. Just look finally then, just look at some of the new covenant promises that God uh, changed himself to. First of all, he has promised to you all our sins. Micah 7, 19, you will tread your... Uh, Treat our sins under uh, tread our sorry. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Now the word for subdue here means to put down or conquer. The Lord promises to mortify and kill off all our sinful habits and strongholds through faith and true repentance. And secondly, He has promised to cause us to walk in holiness. Ezekiel 36, 25 and 27 says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow uh, my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Thirdly, he has promised never to forsake his possessions. The Lord chastens us for our sins, but he never forsakes his seed. Beautiful verse in Psalm 89, 31 to 34. If they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sin with a rod, their iniquity with flogging. But I will not take my love from them, nor will I betray my faithfulness. 
I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. All good promises that we can claim as well. And fourthly, he has promised to put his fear in our hearts. Jeremiah 32, 40, I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them. And I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. God has sworn to give us all the power we need to obey his every word. Indeed, he has given us these covenant promises, so we'll quit trying to overcome sin by our own power. Here's the key to understanding the new covenant, that God has no boundaries or limits. We limit God by our own limited thinking. But he gave us his covenant promise to take off the chains that we put on him. In the Garden of Eden, Satan used God's limited limitless natures as he used Adam and Eve he told them you can be as God he has no boundaries no limits and so can you the Lord had to send his law to show humankind that we can't be as God we simply can't break down all the boundaries and limitations of our flesh so the Lord uses the law to help us recognize our utter powerlessness Jesus also demonstrated this truth he limited himself with the boundaries of flesh saying, without the Father I can do nothing. Yet Christ also came to reveal that any trusting believer can be brought into this new covenant promise. I will be to you, I will be God to you, without limit or boundaries. Revival can take place anywhere the Lord pleases. It can happen in our home, with our children, even among our unsaved loved ones. Our task is to simply give up what the flesh can conceive and to surrender to God's faithful promise. We need to believe him for miracles. As you face your own struggles, remember that God will never give up on you. He calls you to be his friend, and he still has his hand on you. All he asks is for a repentant heart, and absolute trust in his promises. However, we are to heed this warning. God will not quit on us, but we can quit on him. And that leads to hardness of heart. Remember Saul's example? Had that hardened man turned to the Lord instead of a witch, God would have saved him. So by faith, receive his love, his power, his forgiveness and freedom. Your best days are still to come. Psalm 94 verse 14, and I'll finish with this. For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. And I think we can be encouraged by that fact. Amen.